so we'll be able to put this up on our website later on. So I want to thank everybody for coming out on such a wonderful evening. Although it's appropriate because the lake's down a little bit and now we're helping to fill it up. So if anybody doesn't know who I am, I'm Judy Hansen. I'm the superintendent of the Kingston Water Department. Um, I want to introduce a couple of our board members and a few other people that are here. Uh, first, there's our president of our Board of Water Commissioners, um, Dennis Croswell, is here with us. Commissioner Bob Nijelski. Town of Ulster Supervisor Jim Quigley, who um, is our literally our biggest customer. Um, we sell them 700,000 gallons of water a day. Um, Matt Dysard is our business manager. He's kind of doubling as the... Are we back? Yep. All right. We're just going to keep going. And Alderman Doug Coop just walked in. So that's all. We, he likes to make a grand entrance. Um, I'm going to kick us off and go over just an overview of the water system. And then I'm going to turn it over to our design engineer, Dr. Greg DeViro from Schnabel Engineering, and he's going to take you through the project, kind of keep it informal. If you have questions as we go along, just shout them out. Okay. Um, all right, this is, we're just kind of go quick. This should take about a half hour. We're going to go through all of, going to give you an overview of the water supply talk a little bit about Cooper Lake and how it got to be the 1.2 billion gallon reservoir that it is today. What got us here, what the project drivers were, what are elements of the project in the construction schedule and the permitting, and then we're going to wrap it up with why everybody's here, what's it going to do to my water bill? And then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Okay, this is the Kingston water system. Um, Obviously, this is the city of Kingston down here, and we don't, everybody thinks we get our, whoops, everybody thinks we get our water from Cooper Lake. Well, we actually don't. Cooper Lake, in and of itself, has a very small watershed. So, in and of itself, it could never supply the water needs for the city of Kingston. Our water comes from the Mink Hollow stream, <clears throat> and we have an intake on that stream, and that's part of the little beaver kill system, and eventually, our intake is here and it gets piped, will be piped over um, to Cooper Lake. So our water comes from the Mink Hollow stream, and what we take, we are allowed to take everything but a half a million gallons. If there isn't a half a million gallons going by in that stream, we can't take a drop. And eventually it ends up at the Ashokan. Interestingly, our watershed is wholly contained in the Ashokan's watershed. Um, there's no natural connection between our intake, the Mink Hollow Stream, and Cooper Lake. There's a pipe, and so we have control of an intake structure. We can open those pipes, close those pipes, so we can maintain our water quality by when it's a Catskill clay chocolate milk coming down after a hard rainstorm. We just shut the valves at our intake, and the water doesn't go into Cooper Lake. From Cooper Lake, we pipe it from Cooper Lake all the way down to our Edmund T. Coonan Water Treatment Plant, which is down here. This is a uh, treatment plant that is a New York, is an American Water Works historic landmark. It was built in 1899, and it runs exactly the way it was designed with pressure filtration. I also want to say Joanne Sesh, one of our other commissioners, just snuck in the back. Um, so we filter it. Uh, do a little coagulation, filtration, disinfect it with chlorine, and we send it down to our Binny Water Reservoir, which is actually a, a treated water reservoir. Because that's an open reservoir, um, we have a UV uh, disinfection plant just 
on the effluent side of that reservoir. And from there, we have three pipes that you know, cross over under the Esopus Creek, where the old um, Boyce's Trailer Park used to be. Anybody remembers that? Crosses over there, over by the, um, the Chambers Farm over here, which is now a uh, farm, um, farm site um, that they've developed. And then it goes through Green Acres Golf Course and commins comes into the city by the armory there. Um, so this is just kind of a picture. This, this is obviously the Mink Hollow Stream. This is that intake that I was talking about that we we're able to just, in this building there are valves, we're able to just shut those valves. Uh, this is a fish ladder that we installed when we did that um, because this is a very low dam here. It's two or three feet high. Um, this is Coop. I got too, my fingers are too fat on this thing. Um, this is Cooper Lake over here. This is what our Edmund T. Cluing water treatment plant is, what it looks like. Um, we've since taken down this big chimney on the left, but that's how it looked when it was built in 1899. And we go to our UV reservoir into the city of Kingston. We're going to focus obviously on Cooper Lake. Um, this is just an, an aerial shot of um, the dam. The dam is, the main dam is over here, and that's where the outflow, the water comes in from Mink Hollow right here, it's piped in, and this we call the West Dyke, and this is the main dam, and the two of them have to be about at approximately the same elevation to be able to hold water in what's essentially a big bowl. Um, on the left here, the, the dam, as far as we know, was raised at least three times, maybe four, we're not sure. But the, this is, I believe, a 1903 picture, something like that. 1911, 24, and that's 27. And we'll show you what it looks like today in a minute. Um, this holds 1.2 billion gallons of water. It's enough for the city of Kingston, for our demand, for almost a year. We're about a 1.5 billion gallon a day, um, a year flow, a uh, year city. Um, this is 1903. This is what Cooper Lake looked at. This is 212. This is Cooper Lake Road. So this was just a Catskill pond, maybe a quarter of a million gallons. And then uh, we, the Kingston Water Company, which was the forerunner of the Kingston Water Department, acquired those rights in about 1883. Um, we became, we bought all their assets in 1895. We had the rights to the water at that time, and I think by 1899, we actually owned this little pond. And then over the years, we successively dammed it up and made it the 1.2 billion gallon a day reservoir that it is today. And this last slide just kind of shows you um, what the 1903, what it would be like if we superimposed you know, one on the other. So it's a reservoir that we have created and a resource for the water supply for the city of Kingston. You want to take over from here? Do you want? Okay, Greg is going to take you through the project, and I think he's going to want to use some of these aerials to kind of point a few things out. Hi, thanks. I'm Greg DeViro. Thanks, Judy. She showed some interesting pictures of a masonry spillway um, on the previous slide or two. Those are buried underneath the embankment. In 1927, they, the, the last raise, the West Dyke was constructed and the main dam was raised. A, a new spillway was constructed over here and the historic one was buried. So underneath all that is an old masonry structure. What remains is the original intake tower. So this is an aerial view. Uh, taken about a year ago during the drilling program. You can see we have a drilling uh, equipment on there. I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is the outlet tower as it exists today. Uh, from here, water is taken from the reservoir and directed to the water treatment plant. There are three inlets in that tower. Um, as it was designed, you could take water from any elevation and so that you could take the best water quality 
as it is now, those things are no longer operable. Uh, as well, uh, this structure is structurally failing beneath grade, so it needs to be replaced. The main dam, this is a photo taken looking at it. Underneath that rock pile, that what you're seeing is essentially just an armor of rock. Beneath that is soil, which has buried the old masonry spillway. One of the things you're going to hear about is a new outlet works, replacing that tower with new, a new building and new equipment. And what we're doing here is looking at the foundation conditions, trying to figure out the best way to found that uh, building and to construct it in a, in a safe and economical way. So that was one of the explorations. We did explorations along the West Dyke and the main dam over a course of a decade but this is the most recent. This is the spillway. It's a concrete structure. Uh, it was raised in 1958 with this uh, wooden structure. I'll show you a slide or two. Uh, 1957, there was a historic drought, the drought of record here in Kingston, or at least in the Catskills for the water supply system. Uh, immediately following that, these uh, boards were installed to raise the pool to create some storage, and that's where it stayed uh, for the last so 70 years. All right, so the project drivers. As I mentioned, uh, some of the w water supply valving wasn't operable. So in an effort to make a fix, uh, the way you fix a water supply pipe is you turn the water off temporarily. And so you can work on it and then turn the water back on. In an attempt to turn the water off, uh, you have to go to the next valve upstream and close it. This manhole housed the next valve upstream. And I know you probably aren't seeing a lot of manholes in your normal day to day, but normally they're not supposed to be shifted. Uh, usually they're, suppo they're supposed to be concentric all the way down where you could access them safely and get to the valve. But this had shifted considerably. Uh, this was identified in 2007. That spurned some uh, immediate action. Con <laughs> so we can't really date when that happened. It happened sometime between when it was constructed and when it was discovered. It wasn't something that happened uh, at the time it was discovered. It was it had happened. There was some superficial sloughing. So that was uh, the initial impetus. Then in 2009, the state passed new dam safety regulations, which basically said every dam owner has to do uh, certain operations on their dam. They have to do a thorough engineering assessment. They have to do an emergency action plan. They have to do an inspection maintenance plan. And they promulgated that into law. So 2012 was the time that the water department was required to submit on uh, Cooper Lake Dam, which they did. The analysis uh, from that work essentially identified that the spillway that was there was too small. The embankment, while it was stable, didn't meet the factors of safety for stability that the state required or that modern dam standards uh, would require. And that there was no operable low-level outlet. So a low-level outlet is typically designed so in case of an impending failure, you can lower the pool safely in a controlled way before it lowers itself in a catastrophic way. So those three major elements of the work needed to be addressed. And since 2012, Water Department's been moving forward, trying to develop the appropriate plan. At the same time, trying to integrate improvements to the water supply system, or at least restoration of the capabilities that once existed. So we'll be fixing the inoperable intake valves, we'll be adding flow control and redundancy, and we'll be constructing a new reservoir tower. So some of the, those are the drivers, and now here's some of the more specific things. This project is gonna achieve regulatory compliance, and it's gonna do it by uh, providing a new spillway and stilling basin. So the water that comes during a catastrophic, uh, during a 
uh, a Noah's Ark type flood if it were ever to come, if the water can be controlled in a safe manner and discharged from the reservoir. We'll now have a low level outlet where we can safely lower the pool in a controlled but rapid manner. We'll have an embankment that is, meets factors of safety, of stability, and is much easier to maintain. One of the challenges that steep rock slope is hard to inspect, it's hard to walk on. You certainly can't plant grass or mow it. So that will be improved and the West Dyke is gonna be raised uh, and leveled, raised about six to nine inches in different spots and leveled. It's gonna restore, this project's gonna restore the original operational capabilities. As I mentioned, we'll have a new intake tower, new piping and valves, a new metering chamber. And importantly, and one of the reasons why there was a delay between the 2012 study and the design which the city embarked on about two years ago was uh, trying to decide whether this was the time to raise the dam to create more water supply for future uh, potential use during drought. Uh, as Judy mentioned, there's a west dike and a main dam. What ultimately was decided, it, because the work on the main dam needed to be done now to come into compliance, uh, the water board elected that we're gonna raise that dam in preparation for some future raise down the road where we would be able to raise the, the, the water level. So. For the moment, the dam is gonna be raised as if the water level were going to be raised, but we're not going to be water, raising the water level. In order to raise the water level, there would have to be an analogous project at the West Dyke, which the water board's not willing to take on at this particular time. Uh, but uh, cost effectively, they can raise the dam now the extra six feet uh, so they can be prepared for the future. We're expecting the construction to start in 2020, late in the year, likely extend through 2021 and end at the beginning of 2022. Those are soft dates, but depending on project funding and bidding and uh, a couple other activities, that's our target. So this uh, is on display over here if you wanted to look at it. This is what, this is a, a rendering of the future uh, main dam. This is the new water supply tower. The old one was here. Uh, that whole rock rubble is now gonna be uh, replaced with an earthen embankment. Underneath this roadway, you can't see it now or in the future, but there's a concrete core wall. That concrete core wall separates the water supply from the downstream area. It's a barrier to keep the dam from leaking. So that core wall is gonna be extended uh, to the elevation of the dam with a clay core. New piping is gonna come through the, uh, this part of the embankment and tie into a new metering chamber downstream. There'll be a new spillway over here which will discharge through a pipe and terminate in a stilling basin so water can safely be conveyed from the pool along this area, which is no longer along the dam, but in the native soils and discharged into an engineer structure so there's no erosion at the toe. So that's generally what the project looks like. Uh, for the engineers and architects in the room, th this is the site plan. This site plan's over here. Unless you look at these things all the time, it probably doesn't mean much to you, so I'll try to walk you through some of the basics. So the red line is the new water supply piping line. Uh, we're gonna be constructing that. It will connect into the existing, to the existing line uh, that's there. That work is gonna be done uh, on the embankment side. The purple are three new water supply lines where we'll be able to withdraw water from the reservoir at three different elevations, again, restoring what was uh, once there and construct the new tower. So what you're seeing also is a dash line and that dash line is something that I'll talk a little bit more about later, but uh, that's gonna be a, a sheet pile wall that's gonna be built temporarily to facilitate construction so that the contractor can work on this side of the wall while 
we can still use this side water supply. So tricky dam work is you got to keep using the water while you're doing construction. So how we stage the job is important uh, as well as what we're designing. A little tough to see the green line, but it appeared. There's a drop in that spillway here, a new pipe terminating in an impact basin. A key part of this is abandoning the old works. So once the new works are constructed, they will be put into service and tested and utilized, at which point we can then abandon the old works. We can't abandon the old works until the new ones are working. Importantly, there are some historical pipes that run through this embankment that present a risk to the water supply and to the dam. Uh, we're anxious to get those filled with the grout and plugged up uh, and pretty much eliminate all this existing structure. So most of it will be filled with concrete, some will be filled with grout, some of it, everything above the grade will just be cut off and, and taken away. So it will, it will vanish to the eye and get filled in uh, beneath grade. And finally, once we've abandoned it and we've got everything operating, we'll be bringing in the earth and the clay core to raise the dam and create the more stable uh, embankment. And that will be uh, the new project. So water supply works first, abandoned second, new embankment third. Simultaneously, they'll be doing some work on the West Dyke. Uh, minor work, the West Dyke just needs to be leveled so that we have enough freeboard, meaning um, the dam needs to be at an elevation so there's no low point uh, where water could inadvertently fly over or float, <laughs> uh, flow over. I've never seen water fly. So this is a cross section of the dike. What we'll be doing is filling the dike just a little bit, raising it about, depending on where we are, uh, six to nine inches. And you can see it, there are spots where it's a little bit more and spots where it's a little bit less. It's uh, not a big effort over there, but uh, it, what's interesting is the west dike is three times as long as the main dam. So even a little bit of work over there is still a fair amount of work. It's not complicated, it's just uh, spatially significant. All right, so this is something that uh, the city uh, and the engineers elected to do. Because this is the water supply, we didn't want to leave it up to the contractor to determine how they were going to uh, construct uh, the piping in the building that goes through the dam. We wanted to prescribe that. And the, the benefits of that are uh, we can think about it and make sure we're comfortable with uh, the process and eliminate a lot of the uncertainty in the bidding process. If you give six contractors the same job and ask them to figure out how to do it, you'll get six, six different approaches. Perhaps there'll be six that work, perhaps there'll be one, you don't know. You won't know until you have the bids in hand. Likely the lowest cost bid might not be the one that protects your water supply. So we're more concerned about the integrity of the water supply. So we've come up with a process and introduced it into the bid documents. And uh, this is just a, a demonstration of it. So what we're gonna do is install steel sheet pile in the vicinity of uh, where this work is. And what the sheet pile will do is it'll keep the water in the lake and keep the dry side on the other side of the sheet pile. The other thing that, uh, and that will allow us to construct the tower and the new clay core uh, and the new piping uh, in the dry relatively quickly and cost effectively and safely. But it's a significant cost. Uh, your, this coffer dam is essentially supporting, depending on where it is, 15 to 20 feet of water. So it's a significant cost uh, and it's a design feature that 
and needs to be constructed, but it's temporary. So one of the things that the city can do and that we're moving forward with, uh, because the dam has no specific uh, watershed, as Judy mentioned, all the water comes from the Mink Hollow and there's valves there where you can turn it on and off. So unlike most reservoirs, the water department has strict control over that water. If they want the lake level to go down, they can take water out and not bring any in. Uh, if they want it to come up, they can take it in. So, uh, importantly, we're going to be uh, lowering, intentionally lowering the pool by 10 feet down to elevation 1096. Uh, and I'll show you the impact of that. So, why that matters to you. Uh, number one, that's going to significantly reduce the construction cost, particularly on this piece. The other thing it's going to do is because the pool is lower, uh, the work on the rest of the job, there'll be less water to pump and to keep controlled, so the contractor will have some advantages there as well. Uh, the other thing is typically control of water is something that the contractors have the most risk. If it rains, there's a chance that their work will be overtopped by uh, natural causes. In this case, uh, that risk is significantly mitigated by lowering the pool and controlling the, the water source. So we're, we're hopeful that this will be uh, something that can, uh, contractors are gonna be able to take a lot of their unknowns out of their bids to your benefit. So what's the risk? The risk is we've lowered 10 feet of your pool. And what does that mean? Well, I mentioned in 1957 was the worst drought these are two pictures basically at the same place. So this was 1957, uh, significantly lowered pool compared to 2018. This is the historical record. So you can look at this, on this axis is the elevation. So here are things, 11 uh, th this uh, little blip here was 1957. So this is water surface elevation. Uh, generally, the top line here is the elevation of the pool today, 1105.6. All these dips are either seasonal or drought related. This raise, this is the height of the wooden stop planks that were put in after the 1957 drought. So prior to 57, we were holding this elevation. They put in the wooden stop logs and we're holding this elevation. This is the elevation way down here, 1086 of the 57 drought, the 1964 drought, and the 81 drought. This is the elevation we're going to be dropping the pool to. So uh, it's significant in its potential impact. What that means, again, is likely during the construction, you're going to hear about potential water uh, restrictions, and the, the benefit again was the cost savings to do this, but the concern is you don't have enough water to do this. So that uh, initiated another one of the delays, I guess, but for the benefit again of the, the water source, and, and that is to try to solve a problem before the problem occurs. And that's by using our access to the Shokin Reservoir that we can tap into if necessary during the construction project. So Judy shared this with you before. That's the Ashokan Reservoir. So we're going to uh, construct a temporary connection to the Ashokan Reservoir so that in the course of the construction project, should the water supply start to diminish and it not be water available to, to uh, refill Cooper Lake, we'll be able to tie into New York City's Ashokan Reservoir and make sure that the primary purpose, which is the end user, the rate payer, uh, has the water source available to them. This is a kind of blow up of that connection uh, in rather close proximity, the Ashokan Reservoir is to the uh, water treatment plant. About three miles. 
So as every other engineering project, there's a number of permitting processes that we have to go through. Uh, we've cleared a number of them. Uh, we've contacted natural heritage, so there's no threatened or endangered species uh, that we're concerned about. We've contacted state historic preservation. There's no historical significance uh, to any of the structures that we're modifying. Uh, we're in the process of getting the DEP water withdrawal permit in place. Uh, we've also uh, solicited Natural Heritage and, and SHPO for that part of the work. Did it come back? And of course the work is going to have some site specific items that will be submitted once the final design package is completed for a dam safety permit which gets routed through the uh, DEC and uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, where we address um, minor impacts on wetlands, open water work, some filling, some temporary lake lowering, uh, and some temporary piping where we're making roads across streams and so forth. So the project is going to be broken into four phases. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is construct the Ashokan uh, pieces. There's permanent pieces that need to be there and ready to go, so if we ever need to use them, we can use them. The next thing we're gonna do is construct the new water supply tower and piping so that we can turn that on, and once that's operating, we can abandon the existing structures and construct the dam embankment improvements. Somewhere in there, those west dikes, that is west dike work will be done. It's kind of independent. It can be done whenever it's most convenient uh, uh, to, to be done. And cost is always something that people are concerned about, rightfully. So there's a number of elements that have been identified. So the main dam embankment modifications are at two and a half million. The spillway and the West Dyke modifications are about a million. The outlet works and intake modifications, 6.2 million. The Ashokan temporary connections, about a million for a total construction cost of $10.6 million. Then there are the engineering fees uh, for construction activities, bid phase services, and managing the engineering and construction process, which is another 1.3 for a total of 12 million. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Uh, Bill Weissman from Lake Hill. I live right next to the post office in Lake Hill. The intake from uh, the little Beaver Hill uh, goes right under our property. You don't hear me. Do you hear me now? All right, so <laughs> we live right on top of the intake pipe, and I'm just, it's not really clear whether work's going to be done on that or not. Was it, there, uh, so they won't be digging that. There's no need to dig that pipe up. The other question I had was about, um, is there any need for considering wildlife in the area? I know there's a large wetland on the west dike with a, a an open area where there's a tremendous amount of wildlife comes through there. Is there, is there any consideration for that? Sure. That's it. That's it, really. So, um, in terms of the, w the wildlife question, the work that's being done on the West Dyke is intentionally being done inside the reservoir. So, the, the raising is going to take the, the downstream, slope it up, and then where we're filling, we're filling on the reservoir side so as to not impact that wetland area uh, whatsoever. Uh, there are some smaller wetland impacts on the main dam side, mainly the current spillway discharges and creates a small stream. Th those are going to be unavoidably impacted, but um, it's part of the permitting process. We've had a pre-application permit meeting with DEC, uh, Central Office, and Region 4, right? Yeah, three, sorry. Um, as well as the Army Corps of Engineers have weighed in 
So ult ultimately, we still have to submit the final permit application when we have our final design. But we're not, we're not anticipating any hiccups because uh, we think we've captured most of the concerns. And his other, his other question was, are we going to look at the intake piping? And we're not, there's no work to be done on the intake piping. Anybody else have any questions? Captive audience. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Judith. It's, it's, it's a great project and it needs to be done and the council is, is solidly behind it. You've talked about the cost of this. You want to allude to the sources of revenue, how we're going to pay for all this? Okay. That's, that's a question that's really important to a lot of the residents. Um, and, and the concerns that the wood, our Woodstock neighbors have, we're, we're actually going to plan, I, I've talked to your supervisor, we're probably going to go to the community center, probably we're, we're looking at dates now to kind of coordinate everything, because I think the, you know, the financial concerns are here with our rate payers, but you've got quality of life issues. When are, we gonna, when are we gonna do the construction? What are the hours, uh, all those things? And we're pretty sensitive to that, so we're looking for that kind of input. As long as they don't trespass, they're fine. But, but, but the road itself is nice and flat, and it's a lovely walk. You know, there's no hills, it's, and it's beautiful. There, there's no question about it. So let's talk a little bit about the financial impacts. Um, and one of the things that, that we talked about, the connection to the Ashokan, one of the things I really need to mention before Jim Quigley does, is that we have a connection and we provide the town of Ulster with 700,000 gallons a day. But we're very lucky that the town of Ulster also has the ability to make their own water. So we could, before we activate that Ashokan connection, and we'll look at the money and all that, but. New York City isn't going to give us the water for free, nor should they. So they're charging us eight, they would, the current rate for, for raw water from New York City is $1,800 a million gallons. But if, it depends on the severity of the drought. We need to plan for the worst, but one of the options we certainly would consider is asking the town of Ulster to go on their own supply, and then they can send us an additional 300,000 guys? Right, so we could almost make a million gallons from the, by not serving them water and by having them send water back to us. So those things are always in play. It's just, we really, the Shokan connection really needs to be there. Here we go. I guess you turn it upside down, it comes back on. Anyway, let's talk about the finances. So Greg alluded to the fact that this is a $12 million project. Please note, plus or minus. Uh, I say that because there's a range. We don't actually have a real number until we get a bid. Um, and any time an engineer says, this is our probable construction cost, there's a range. So our range in there is probably 11, seven, 10, seven to, a, to I think 13, five, something like that, yeah. So, so there is definitely a range in there. So, um, but we're gonna use 12 million as kind of a nice round number to talk about. Our budget is $4.8 million in 2019. I like to tell everybody that we're the lowest major department, lowest budget in the city of Kingston in terms of major departments. Um, we get no money from the city coffers, no money from your taxes, no money. We get it all from the sale of water. So of the $4.8 million, four and a half comes from water sales, and the other 300000 is cell tower income, um, we get paid actually to run the Ulster County Golden Hill water system, get a, a slight amount of money for that, and we sell taps and some other related things. But that's a minor component. A full 91, 90, 93% of our income, 94%, comes from the sale of water. So if you take four and a half million dollars, every $45,000 increase in our spending is a 1% increase in our rates. It's really simple math. Um, 
That's just kind of a pie chart to show you that 94% of our revenue of the 4.8 is water sales and 6% is kind of other. Um, these are our expense side. If there's revenue, there's got to be expenses. Uh, our salaries and benefits total um, probably 50, over 51% and 17%, 16% is our current debt service. Um, taxes 7%, we pay those to, largely to Woodstock. We're not tax exempt, so we are, we do contribute to the town in terms of about a quarter of a million dollars a year in taxes. So where does anybody get money for, for these things? Um, there's always grants. That's the thing we all like is, you know, to, to see, see, search out grants. Um, I can tell you the board and the mayor and myself, we have made several trips to Albany. We have chatted with our assemblymen. We have chatted with our state senator. They have worked tirelessly on our behalf. We've, I've made three trips to Washington to talk to our federal representatives. Um, and there's no money to fix dams. There's just no grant programs, no subsidized programs in the country. I know that that sounds crazy. And I asked, EFC is the, the um, environmental, um, the New York State's bank, it's what? Yeah, an Environmental Facilities Corporation. They do a wonderful job of taking federal dollars that they get and leveraging them and handing out low interest and subsidized interest loans for New York State. They do a great job. And when I asked the one gentleman up there why there's no money for dams, he said the costs are so huge that three projects would eat up all the money. So they've just made a decision not to fund dam work, either drinking water or on the clean water side. The good news for us is, as, as Greg showed you in his slide, phase one and phase two, the construction, it's about $7 million, and that's directly related to drinking water. It's not really related to the dam work. It has to be done before we can, we can fix that dam. We have to make that Shokan connection, the temporary connection, and we also have to make, um, the, build that intake structure. So we will be eligible for at least, or at least we believe we're eligible for funding under the DWSRF and WIA, and what they stand for is WIA is, the governor just announced and uh, he had this program since 2017. This is all New York State money. Um, I think he committed $3 billion to this effort. He just announced in July 25th of this year a new round of funding with some more money. Um, most of it geared toward the, those emerging contaminants of concern that we're finding, PFAS and 1,4-dioxane. But there is some money available for grants for drinking water um, they will fund up to 60% of the, that $7 million project with a maximum grant of $3 million. So they want us to have some skin in the game, but they would give you 60% up to a maximum of three, which three is a quarter of 12, so we're hoping. It's highly competitive. We've submitted the application. The balance of that funding of the, the, the $4 million, which would be the balance, is likely could come from the, this is the federal money in, that the EFC manages. It's the Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund. There's one on the clean water side, and in the United States of America, we are the only place in the world where when anybody says on the clean water side of the house, we mean the wastewater. So we're drinking water, they're clean water. Sorta. When they get done, it is. Anyway, it's a subsidized loan program, and instead of paying three percent, three and a half percent interest, they're subsidized. You're probably down at one, maybe one and a half. So it's pretty significant on a, a magnitude of this size. So Matt and I, with in conjunction with our engineers and one of the sub sub engineering consultants that Schnabel has engaged is CDM Smith, and so. All four of us have kind of collaborated, and we did get the grant application in. There's some questions about some of, some of the paperwork, but we're working on that. So we're hopeful if we don't get it in this round, we're hoping we'll get it in the next round. So of course there's grants, like I, we were just talking about, and we could be eligible, and it's highly competitive, and everybody I talked to has submitted an application. 
Um, we'll hear from that about that probably in the December time frame. That's usually when they let it you know, let that information out. There's a DWR, DWSRF for the drink those phase one and phase two, which could be subsidized. But for the balance of the project, we're probably looking at market rate municipal bonds. And the interest rate we're looking at is anywhere from three to three and a half. You know, interest rates are going to vary. The term could vary, of, of the length of the term of the borrowing, and how much we borrow. Um, so let's talk about the worst case. We have to go out for a, a, a municipal bond on the open market for $12 million at 3.5% interest and for 20 years. So that means our annual costs are $807,000 per year paying that back. Um, based on current water sales of $4.5 million, as I mentioned, each $4,500 is a 1% rate increase. The math kind of shows you we're dealing with maybe a 19% rate increase. The caveats to that are we have to think about what we're actually going to fund, the amount financed, what the final project cost is, what the interest rates are. The term, this project has a 50-year life span, but you can't sell a 50-year bond as a practical matter. And so I think you can't even really sell 30-year bonds. You're really looking at 20-year bonds. Um, at least that's our conversations we've had with John Tui so far and our fiscal advisor. But that could change. And it assumes that the board elects to do a straight percentage increase across all of our rate classes. And that may or may not happen. And I'll explain why. In terms of rates, one size doesn't fit all. It's all very specific for your... Um, your utility and your community. So 25% have a tiered rate. They either, the more you use, the more you pay, which happens out in the drought-stricken West, usually in California and places like that. About 7% of that 25% are people, the more you use, the more you pay. City of Kingston, we're historically a manufacturing community. And so the more, the more you use, the less you pay. But that's based on our cost of operations to different customer classes. The second common is 29%. They're almost the same as a flat tier. You play, it's $5 a gallon, $5 for a thou per thousand gallons, no matter how much water you use. And everybody pays that same rate. That's very common in bedroom communities where you're mostly almost all residential. And then there's a crazy 44% that have flat rates. Like, everybody throw in 50 bucks and we'll pay the bill. It's, does, it's not based on consumption. Uh, I was surprised when I saw it was 44% because that just seemed a little crazy. Um, the Ki city of Kingston used to be like that. Prior in the 1960s, when we, inst when we brought in meters, you paid by how many uh, water, water outlets you had in your house. So many toilets, so many sinks, so many showers, and it was, but it was, but you could consume all you wanted. So this is our tiered schedule. The important takeaway here, I think, is that we have a minimum bill that everybody pays. Everybody pays $46.80, and for that, we'll let you use up to four units. 15%, little over 15% of all of our customers, that's the bill that they pay, because they always use less than four units of water. But if you look at the first three steps here, between the base rate, which we all pay, 92% of our customers use less than 40 units a quarter. Very few of our, I mean, this seems like, you know, if you're paying $3.31 and this guy down here, with the majority of his bill is, you know, $1.80, only less than 2%, that's, that's the hospitals. That's really who that is right there. Um, so the board has been looking at and, and very seriously, and Matt's done a lot of work on this, trying to collapsing this a little bit, making this, making these rates kind of maybe have three tiers ultimately over the next four or five years. So we're looking at, the, you know, so that could, that could eclipse some of, of um, that 20%, should it be that high. Yep. So that's a quarterly. Yes, and our bills are quarterly. I, I know everybody in here that's, a resident understands that, but yes, they're quarterly bills. So 
what's that really mean? So the average family uses, there is no real average, but 20 units is a pretty good, you know, a lot of people use around that 20 units per quarter. So you were currently paying just under $400 a year for your drinking water, and if it goes up 20% straight across the board, you'd be paying $80 more a year. If you're the minimum bill payer, if you're one person living by yourself and, you know, four units, each unit is 748 gallons. That's, that's a lot of water if, you're, if you live by yourself and you're out working all day. Um, their current bill is $187.20 a year for the, all their water. 20% increase would be a $37.42 increase for those folks. So we're hoping for a mix of funding. We're hoping to bring this project in at 12 million, but it could be plus or minus a little bit. Um, I'm not sure that the decision will be made by the board to increase it uniformly, or they may decide to alter the rate schedule a little bit. Um, and I can speak for Dennis in particular, only other commissioners. They're always looking to cut costs. I mean, we want to spend more money, the, the staff, we, we've really got to make our case. I, I think you'd agree with that, right? You know, he's just... Um, the interest rates and the term are going to be... And I just want to... I just wanted to leave you with this. This is a difficult slide to see, but what I have here is most people around here, and these were actual costs I got from Central Hudson and what I pay for cable, so most, most of us pay $200 a month for cable. That's $2,400 a year. Whether you use natural gas or oil, you're paying somewhere between $1,700 and $2,200 for your oil every year. I know cell phone is not a necessity, but most of us pay $100 a month for that if you have a smartphone, um, and that's $1,200. Um, we're paying about $1,100 for electricity, and the Central Hudson cost came right off their website. But yet we're asking you to pay less than $500 a year for the one thing on all that list that you can't live without. I just wanted to kind of leave you with that. Um, so anybody have questions? Yes, sir, Mr. Quigley. As you know, we have had numerous discussions about the decreasing usage of water in the city of Kingston. Has any consideration been given to the financial impacts that a price increase is going to drive the users within the city to use less water, producing less revenue, therefore driving up everybody else's cost? Anytime you have a rate increase, that happens. There's most of the demand for water. There is some inelastic, there's some inelastic and some elastic demand. I mean, people can, can cut down on some things. I will tell you that for the past 25, 30 years, we budget very conservatively for water sales. We'll never inflate that number to make the budget balance. It's just, that's just bad. I mean, that's just, that just gets to you at the end of the year you don't have enough money. We've always come within two or three percent of our target every year on, in terms of, of budgeting. Um, but you're right, there is, if you have a big rate increase, some people are going to cut their consumption. So that has to be factored into the rate increase when you set the amount. So, anybody else? Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, I, I arrived a little late, and I, and, and I want to ask a question. When you lower the uh, water in the reservoir, is, is the spillway going to be the same amount of water going down the spillway, or is it going to dry up? And I asked this question because you might <coughs> be considering that there might be some endangered species living in this spillway. There is a... a salamander that is a protected creature that lives here and 
uh, is anyone considered what's going to happen to that spillway if you lower the uh, dam? Is this, are you going to be dumping water down it or is it going to dry up? Uh, have you considered the uh, indigenous life that lives there? I arrived a little late. I wanted to ask him that question, but uh, you went into the finances. Thank you. Can you answer that question? We both, we'll both take a shot at it. First, I want to tell you our spillway right now is concrete. Our, it's a concrete spillway that dumps into the Sawk Hill, and it's dry almost all the time because the part that you missed, I think, was that we don't, the, Cooper Lake has a very small watershed. So we have to, we get all our water from Mink Hollow, which is a stream that's a mile away, and it's, there's no natural connection between Mink Hollow and Cooper Lake, and so we have pipes, and we have, we can shut those pipes off. So we actually, when the lake is full, those pipes are off. So it, it, the spillway will run, but it, it's not, it doesn't run all, it runs two or three days a year maybe at most. So, Greg, you want to add anything to that? So, I, I mentioned that we've we've already had uh, we've already uh, petitioned Natural Her New York State Natural Heritage to try to identify any threatened or endangered species in the area where we're working. So, um, we haven't heard anything on. If you're not giving me the information on this salamander, I'll take it because. I'd rather know now than be surprised later. So I'm, I'm interested in that. But uh, nothing has been identified. There are some um, specific uh, hardwood trees that were identified nearby, but not on our project site. The other thing I wanted to mention is uh, the, the spillway, when it does run, discharges into a tributary of the Sauk Hill. Uh, this project is, will temporarily stall that, but will ultimately restore that. So water will still be feeding uh, that uh, tributary to the Sawk Hill at the same rates as it does now. General traffic uh, due to Increase due to construction as far as workers and work vehicles and all that. And is it going to be in two? I guess you showed that it was going to be in separate parts, the two ends of the lake. Uh, well, that's, that's <laughs> Most of the work is going to be on the main dam, which really is quite a distance off of 212. Clearly, you're going to hear some noise across the water because I can. It's a, people are amazing. They can, they can be trespassing over on the other side. And you can actually hear some of the conversations if it's quiet enough. And I'm sure when you live that close, you know that. Um, people have no appreciation for how far sound travels on that water. Um, but it should be away from the public view. Shouldn't be all that noisy, you know, maybe a little bit. But the big thing is when we go to do the dam work, the actual last component, it's a lot of truck. A lot of trucks going up and down. We've talked to, we've talked to you know, Bill McKenna about that, and um, your highway supervisor w was actually at our pre-bid meeting to kind of, so we've, we've tried to loop them in. Um, if there's times when, I mean, I don't think there's any other way, come up 28, 375, it's going right through town. Uh, unless, if there's a better way, tell me what it is, and we'll reroute them. But it, that'll be for, how long would you estimate that phase to be? Half a year, and, but but I mean it's Monday through Friday. Was put in there. Very finicky, this thing. Um, it, 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 we, we'd be happy to do that, you know, any, any kind of reasonable accommodations. So, I mean, because it, it, it's your home that we're, we have to do this right next to. So. Do you have any information on how the endangered species or any kind of what's happening there? You might want to talk to DEP, wetland, or state people. 
Um, we've talked to DEC folks. They've been at the meetings. Yeah, I know. This is not in DEP's watershed. They might. We, we certainly can take that into consideration. But Cooper Lake, Mink Hollow is their watershed. Cooper Lake? No, I know because, yes, they... They, they have they have their um, they have an easement to that parcel up there through our property so we're, we kind of are contiguous property owners over there yeah yep anybody else going once twice I want to thank everybody it's a lovely night out there you have any other questions you know well you can email me and what and obviously if it's technical we'll get a hold of Greg and we'll get an answer back for you but we are going to hold something up in, in your neck of the woods probably at the community center I just you know having I just got to nail those dates down I got to find out when availability from some of our board members and and when Bill can let us have the room so all right thank you